Our, thank you, Pierre David, for uh, introduction, warm introduction. Um, so, we're, actually, this is my second time at NorthSec, and you're, I'm really pleased to uh, give a presentation on this stage with your, uh, other speakers. It's a really great event. And uh, today, I will be speaking about distributing reverse engineering uh, for large scale malware processing. And in a nutshell, we have a large uh, collection of uh, malware, millions of samples, and we wanted to distribute reverse engineering the, of this collection uh, across a small cluster. Uh, this presentation is co-authored uh, by me and Alexander Matrosov. He is not here today. He is a security researcher with Intel in the United States. But however, I would like to give also credits to uh, Gabriel Barboza and Rodrigo Branco. Those are researchers uh, with which we collaborated on, their, uh, on, on this research, which was originally presented at Black Hat in 2015. And at the bottom of this uh, slide, uh, there is a reference. So, uh, uh, I will start with a small disclaimer that opinions presented in this presentation does not necessarily reflect the opinions of our employers, and we are responsible for all the results or uh, uh, mistakes and whatever, so blame us, not our employers. And let's start with a uh, picture of the hardware. So basically, this is a small cluster that we were using uh, in this research. You can see everything is well set up. Uh, we had about nine machines, and there is even like an AC here to cool down the system when it works really hard. But however, if you look at the different uh, angle, uh, there are still some uh, room for improvement. Like, and interestingly, that we were working on this research uh, in July, June, and it was really hot in Oregon, Hillsborough. And their electricity at some point went down, so we're really thankful for fire detection and smoker system, which prevented from a disaster. So I hope Rodrigo's insurance company won't see this light. And here is the agenda of today's presentation. So we'll start first with your introduction and your explain our objectives and motivation. Why did we do it this way? And why did actually we start this research? And then we'll go to a detailed overview of the process. How did we process malware, which are machine learning algorithms, or which are uh, malware analysis algorithms we were applying to them? And then we will go to the discussion of the results we obtained. Uh, and finally, we will present some validation of the methodology and tool set uh, to be able to confirm that our approach that we are decided to take is correct or it contains some flaws and needs some improvement. And then I will wrap up with the presentation with some uh, conclusions and acknowledgements. So basically, uh, they're one of the most, uh, uh, so about the motivation, I think their uh, presentation of Olivier, uh, Bilodeau, and Hugo uh, yesterday about DevOps was a very nice uh, explanation that the malware is growing with an absurd space and we need to have a scalable uh, analysis environment. So that's what we tried to build because right now the process is focused per single sample analysis and this is mostly manual work so we decided to try to scale our, our analysis algorithms uh, for large collection and we also tried to provide a uh, research material for, for the researchers in this area to be able to contribute as well to use our results and build their research on top of them. So the objectives were just to demonstrate their possibility of in-depth large-scale malware analysis, and I want to highlight here a word in-depth, because right now there is quite a bit of a framework, frameworks that can, uh, that allow to do our analysis, but in most of the cases it's quite shallower, and they're allowed to do some kind of filtering whether this is malware or not, but in-depth we are mean a complete disassembler of, their, of the malware sample. We also tried to distribute across the cluster IDA Pro with Hexray's decompiler. So why did we pick up IDA Pro? Because this is an indispensable tool for malware analysis. It is widely used in the, in the industry. And so we were kind of interested in, okay, so uh, if we can uh, uh, do this or automatically in a batch mode on the cluster. And your, uh, another objective is to share with the community all the information that we generated, IDB files or scripts or uh, dumped intermediate representation, and so on. 
uh, let's speak about the scope of this research, the scope of the project. So we are limit our the sample set to only 32 and 64 bit P executables. That means our executables for Microsoft Windows platform, which were not packed. Uh, we were using mostly static analysis. Why static analysis? I will explain on the next slides. But uh, we were doing only st uh, static analysis for for this reason. We need to have unpacked your uh, samples. We didn't impose any restrictions on the size of the malware. So we had a processor in our collection uh, samples as large as their several uh, like tens of megabytes. And uh, we were given a preference to Microsoft Visual C++ compiler. So we analyzed samples compiled with Microsoft C++ because of using our Hexrace Code Explorer, which works right now only with their Microsoft Visual C++ object-oriented types. And uh, we were using this cluster, uh, which Rodrigo and Gabriel worked on, and they presented this result at Black Hat uh, 2012. So uh, this paper contains the complete description of their infrastructure. But in brief, we have about nine machines. They're sharing 72 cores and 100 uh, gigabytes of RAM. And here is the brief overview of the methodology and of, of, the, of the process. So we started by pre-processing, so we take our, uh, uh, samples from opener uh, sources and uh, uh, started to filter out. So we filter it out everything, what's not 32 or 64 bits or non-packed malware. And uh, I think in the input we have about uh, almost 8 million samples. After filtering out all their uh, uh, samples that are uh, don't meet these criteria, we started with referring, uh, running them in, a, in the analysis environment and applying different machine learning uh, uh, malware analysis algorithms, and we were obtaining results from their uh, decompilation and disassembler, and we're storing them in the local file system in, in files. At the next step, we did their structuring and aggregation of the information to be able to process this to compute some statistics or to do data analysis. That was done in phase number four. Uh, this research, we were uh, using our uh, only static analysis uh, for the following reasons. Uh, generally, dynamic analysis takes longer time than static analysis, and since we had a very large uh, uh, sample set, for us, the performance was really crucial. So uh, in static analysis, you don't have to spend like overhead time for setting up the execution environment. We're just loading the file or in the disassembler, and it works uh, pretty fast. Uh, unless there is their sample obfuscated, packed, or the exploitive vulnerability in their analysis environment. Of course, there are some limitations, for instance. Uh, when you're uh, disassembling, you need to make sure that there is a, a good coverage of your disassembled code. For instance, there is some, some, there is some dead code, which your disassembler is not able to identify. It's not reachable from the entry point. But however, I deploy it or has a very nice heuristics and generally it provides a very nice coverage for your disassembly. So that's why we uh, decided to go with this uh, tool. And in addition, we use the following software, additional software to or get our, uh, additional data. So we used our Hexrace Code Explorer uh, to dump C trees there of some other recognized functions. I will explain what the C tree is later, but so far you can consider C tree as your, an abstract or intermediate representation of your uh, decompiled function. And your, uh, we also uh, were extracting uh, object oriented types from the, from the file uh, using Hexrace Code Explorer. Uh, when dumping C trees are from their uh, IDB file, so an IDB file is basically, I'm pretty sure everyone knows, this is your uh, file where IDA Pro stores all their, all their results of the disassembly. So I will be frequently using this acronym IDB file to refer to the results of the disassembly. So we were computing a, a C tree depth, like uh, how far this function is from the entry point in the call hierarchy. Uh, we were also interested in seeing how many malware is actually using the newer instructions which are implemented, hardware implementation of the advanced encryption standard and your GetSec instruction which is your, uh, works with the Intel technology as SMX or safer mod extension. Uh, 
Additionally, we were doing study of the, uh, this pointer usage. So this pointer is an implicit pointer, which is used in object-oriented languages to refer to the instance of the object. And we were paying attention to their, its actual implementation within the code. For instance, Microsoft or uh, Visual C++ is, is, is implementing this pointer by means of our E6 register or our CX register, if we're speaking about 64-bit platform. But however, sometimes when you're doing some optimizations, it can uh, use other registers, ECI or EDI register. So we're really interested in uh, looking how actually pointer this is implemented here for these compilers. And we are also uh, we're analyzing uh, crypto, uh, cryptographic functions, functions implementing cryptographic primitives using the IDScope plugin. So let's take a look at uh, their, uh, how, their, uh, how this process works uh, regarding dumping entries. So first, we loaded your, a file in their IDA Pro. We waited until their auto analysis is completed, the functions are identified, and we started by enumerating those routines in their uh, disassembled files. And uh, we started with their uh, dumping. Uh, so we processed a certain number of the routines because like some IDB files, they contained up to a thousand routines and more. And in this case, we don't have much space to store uh, first all the data. And uh, secondly, not all the data are really interested uh, because for instance, there are some many small routines which are just contaminate the, uh, the data set because they present in every sample. So we decided to filter them out, and as a result, we were f uh, processing first 60 routines of size larger than 116 hexadecimal. Uh, we were processing 30 uh, crypto routines identified using their advanced encryption standard or uh, spotted by their IDScope plugin, and we were uh, processing the first 60 other routines uh, bigger than 60 bytes. Those constants, 60 and 160, were chosen empirically using our experience and mail analysis and their uh, during the manual analysis. Uh, once we are, uh, find a function, we are, uh, decompile function using hex trace decompiler. As a result, we obtain intermediate representation, C3, and we serialize C3 to uh, a string. But before serializing, we are doing C3 normalization. The normalization is important to make sure that same role functions, they have the same C3s. For instance, you can uh, imagine two functions where they're exactly the same, except in one uh, function, the local variable is initialized with variable one, and the second function, uh, the same local variable is initialized with value two. So those functions are very similar, and we want to have exactly the similar C trees, but since the different uh, initializers are used, C trees will be different. So during normalization, we're uh, filtered out everything from the C tree, which is not really relevant, to keep the general structure of the, of the function and to dump it. So um, I will say a few words about this later. Uh, next thing, we are uh, dumped information about object-oriented types. Uh, the object-oriented types it contains your two interesting properties. First, the virtual table, which contains pointers to their um, polymorphic methods, so basically methods which were overwritten in their subclass. To do this, we were finding all the references to these pointers within their IDB file, and we were looking for virtual tables which, are, uh, which were uh, stored in the following sections. Our data, data, or section with any other name but with the data attribute. So usually Microsoft Visual C++ compiler puts them in the R data or data, but sometimes due to obfuscation, the sections may be renamed, so we're, we analyzed all the data sections, and we were finding all the cross-references to virtual tables within the, within the IDB. Later, we used some heuristics to determine the size of the virtual table and the total number of the methods in this virtual table. Uh, the code are, uh, those heuristics, they are available in GitHub account for Hex Race Code Explorer, so you can go there and see how we're doing this. And uh, uh, once we recognize virtual table, we create structure re representing this table and include this in the, re in the result. Uh, in addition, to finding virtual tables, we also did reconstruction of their types attributes. Uh, in order to do this, first we identify an instance of the object within the IDB file, and then we find cross-references to its constructor. So 
And once we go into the constructor, this is the part from where we actually define the attributes because let's say most of the attributes they are initialized within the constructor. And once we go within the, within the constructor, we can see, okay, this is the, this, it points to this buffer, and we're actually tracking all the references to different offsets within this buffer with, their, uh, uh, with the size of the reference. So basically, this defines the layout of the type. Uh, we are filtering types which contains only three attributes or more, because there are actually many types. When we first uh, started to run this uh, on a smaller sample set, we got many types which are contains zero, one, or two or, um, attributes, and this is not really interesting for the results. So we are filtered out small data types and left only the, the ones which have three attributes or more. One dump in C trees, we're, we're computing how far it is from the entry point and the total number of the cross references. Uh, for this, we enumerate cross references to this, to this routine, and we use we used a breadth first search algorithm to find if we can reach an entry point from this or from this routine, and uh, we limited our uh, search to two, to 100 nodes just to make sure we are not running infinitely. And once we find the, um, an entry point, we uh, calculate the distance from the entry point and the total number of the cross references. When it comes to identifying our advanced encryption standard, new instruction set, and get sec, we used our, a linear sweep approach in this case, because it, it is faster. So we, we always start processing with the section where entry points point at. And our, we scan first our uh, half megabytes of the, of the section. We use a, a linear sweep disassembler. And once we identify GetSec and the Advanced Decryption Standard uh, uh, instructions, we look uh, for 15 instructions before and after to see if, there, if all these instructions are correctly disassembled. Because this may be the case if we are, let's say, uh, start disassembling an instruction not from the right of set, but let's say from the middle of the instruction, we get the uh, AS instruction. And then there is a summer uh, bad instructions, so that means that we are probably not doing this in the right way. Uh, regarding the, uh, this usage study, uh, we were checking up to 5,000 calls within their each IDB file, and we were analyzing five preceding instructions to a call to see if there is a uh, loading of the E6 register. We use some heuristics to find uh, if the E6 register is being loaded with some value, for instance, it is a um, move instruction or load effective address. And once we are, uh, identify all their calls which are load in E6 register, we compute their percentage and you're included this in the results. Uh, a few words about distributing IDA Pro. We were really surprised with the performance we, uh, we, we got uh, using IDA Pro because actually we were a little bit skeptical about this because you're, when you analyze your uh, sample or let's say your single sample analysis, IDA Pro is a kind of interactive disassembler. It uh, shows you a lot of uh, dialog or boxes uh, trying to choose different parameters for analysis. It does the auto analysis and once your, your auto analysis is completed, you need to enumerate through the routines within this IDB file and do this in an efficient way. But however, the performance was really uh, nice and your, uh, um, so yeah, it met our expectations. Um, however, there are some uh, problems. First, related to our developing uh, IDA Pro plugins is the key. SDK is complex and are quite are, uh, well, probably the comments is are there any people in the audience who are developed your either Pro plugin or hex raise? Please raise your hands. Okay, not too many people. And uh, also the thing is that uh, the uh, signatures of the functions uh, can change from our, uh, a version to version, so that, man, uh, that means uh, sometimes you have uh, problems with the compatibility between different versions, let's say either 6.8 or 6.9. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a really good performance on uh, commodity hardware. We didn't have a high-end systems, uh, like about eight cores per machine and 10 gigs of RAM. And another observation is that uh, most of the plugins, uh, they were 
uh, written for Microsoft Windows platform. Like they were using Windows API, they were using Windows types, or before making them work on Linux because our environment was uh, running on Linux, or we had to um, apply some efforts uh, to pro them. Uh, another observation is that where most of the plugins are not made to scale, like they are targeting a single sample analysis as well as an IDA Pro. So that was her, uh, one of the ob observations which were made. And uh, interestingly, when we run uh, IDA Pro with the plugins on the large sample set, or we are identified many bugs or in IDA, in our code, in other uh, plugins, so it was a very nice test. So if you're interested in testing your plugin, please uh, send us and uh, we'll try uh, to uh, see how it works. And uh, now I want to say a few words about their Hexrace Code Explorer. I and Alex, we are developers of the Hexrace Code Explorer. The first version was released on uh, Ericon 2013, and the latest version works on IDA uh, 6.9, but however, some guys approached me and they told that there were some bugs in the course, or please, if you find the bug, you can go to the GitHub page and um, report it there. There, I think this was the most efficient way of reporting the bug. So there are numerous features in the Hexrace Code Explorer. So originally it was designed to facilitate object-oriented code analysis and your uh, 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 position-independent code analysis, but in this research particularly, we were using only one feature, which is extracting uh, object-oriented type information from the uh, from the uh, from the binary. And right now, I'm going to give some uh, low-level information because the Hexrace Code Explorer works with their Hexrace decompiler, which is uh, using the C tree, the intermediate representation of the decompiled routine. And uh, here is the explanation of what actually C3 is. C3 is an, an abstract syntax tree which represents their uh, decompilation. For instance, on the left-hand side or uh, part of the slide, you can see here a, an expression, variable two, variable uh, three equals variable two plus variable seven. And on the right-hand side, you can see how this is actually implemented in our uh, C3. So we can see here, uh, sorry, there is, a mouse here. No, okay. So there is, oops, sorry. All right, uh, so there is an assignment operator which corresponds to, uh, which, oh, there we go. Yeah, so there is an assignment operator here, which corresponds to the this equal sign. And there, so the variable three is located on the left-hand side of this operator, and on the right-hand side we have an addition, which takes uh, two parameters, variable three and variable seven. So this is the way actually the, uh, how C3 looks like uh, in the decompiler and how we work, uh, how it works with. So uh, each block within C3 is, your, is of type C item T. And C item T actually is a base class for two subclasses, uh, one representing expressions and the other one representing statements. So statements basically, they correspond directly to the statements in the C language. These are the blocks or uh, E4, while expression is something what has a type. So uh, you need to make sure uh, that your, the type information is consistent in the C tree. For instance, if you're calling a function and passing it in an, in an integer, then you need to make sure that their C tree block representing an integer actually has a type integer. And that is, this is the only requirement because your, uh, their hex racer uh, SDK allows you to do whatever you want with the C tree, but you need to make sure that the type information is, consist is, is consistent. And also, uh, Hexrace offers a convenient way for traversing those uh, structures if you need to enumerate their blocks or do some transformation with them. Okay, so let's take a look how this uh, is used in this research. So we did a type reconstruction. We reconstructed object-oriented types, and uh, for type reconstruction, there are two essential steps. First, we identify virtual table, and a virtual table is related to polymorphic types. 
uh, because if there is no polymorphism, there is no reason for a virtual table, because all the functions, they are called directly. And virtual tables contains pointer to the functions which are actually overwritten, and their recovering virtual tables are, gives us very interesting results about the type hierarchy. And there another, uh, uh, another idea which we used is a type attribute identification, reconstructing type attributes. So for instance, uh, here we can see that there is a, a virtual table identified in the IDB file. So it is here, and we can see that there is a cross references to this virtual table and this function. So if we go to this function, this is a constructor. So we get a constructor, we have this pointer, and we have attributes uh, in this object. So the idea is to reconstruct those, att uh, those attributes. This is actually what we are doing, and we are obtaining this uh, uh, structure representing the type and its attributes and their virtual table as well. Regarding normalizing the trees, so here is the implementation of their filter C item routine, which does filtering of their uh, blocks within their C tree, which are not uh, relevant. So we are skipping some cast operations, some helper functions, and some other minor uh, blocks. And for instance, here is the complete C tree of a function. And uh, everything what is marked here with black or blue is included in the C tree and everything what is marked with red is uh, filtered out. And here are some uh, general uh, thoughts about like pros and cons of using hex trace intermediate representation. The good thing is that you are working with your uh, not platform dependent code because your uh, hex trace decompiler uh, works with your 32 or 64 bit ARM and your you don't have to care about actual up calls because you're working at higher abstraction level, at basically at source code level analysis. But however, there are some uh, uh, disadvantages as well. First, that the hex trace is designed for single function analysis. Even though there is an option, you can just run, okay, decompile the whole function, but what you will get is not, is not going to be a really accurate uh, decompilation because you're, uh, the results of a subsequent decompilation may invalidate or change results of the previous decompilation. You can imagine like you have two functions, function one and function two, and function two is called from the function one. So you first decompile function one, then you go to decompile function two, and during decompilation of the function two, Hexrace identifies some parameters that were not identified at the decompilation function one. And as a result, the signature of the function is changed, and you need to back, go back to function one and decompile it properly so that you can see a proper call to the function two. So this is one of your limitations and constraints we are faced here at this research. Now let's go to the uh, results we are obtained here by analysis of all their intermediate representations we obtained here, uh, uh, while running this uh, in a cluster. So uh, I included a subset of the results. The complete version is available in the Black Hat talk and the Black Hat presentation. So first we started with pre-processing of 7.8 million samples. And uh, as it appears, like only 31% of them were not packed. So this is uh, the sample set we were using. And out of this 31%, 13% was only using our Microsoft Visual C++ as a compiler. Uh, I think that the most uh, popular packer was UPX and its modifications. Uh, here is the results of the use uh, of this usage uh, study. So on this slide, we can see a table with the top 10 percentages of this usage, like how many per percentage of the calls that were loaded in ECX register. Well, actually, uh, I don't see here any interesting like uh, function of uh, loading E6 and their uh, prevalence of the percentage. Uh, like we have a maximum at four percent of calls, and however, we can see also a high value of 64, 66 percent. So, from this point of view, like we try to use this identification, uh, this E6 registry. Um, 
XX register identification tour to be able to automatically filter out your uh, code which is using uh, object or objects uh, like object oriented model or not. So for this reason, we are, we've chosen a threshold to limit her, uh, which is uh, around one or two percent to be able to filter out. Uh, if we have percentage less than this, we consider that this is our not object-oriented code and we are not going to consider this in the research. Uh, this is the uh, information on the top 10 repeated C trees. So in total, we have our 8 million C trees dumped and obtained from, their, uh, from the samples. And uh, some C trees are uh, like very frequent. We had their 40,000 uh, C trees, uh, which is 0.4 percent, and uh, this most one is 14,000. And if we take a look at their uh, unique C trees, we find that 30 percent of these C trees are shared between different samples, while 70 percent are pretty much unique or on their are pretty much unique or to our specific or, um, sample. So this is an uh, interesting result, or, uh, which requires a further investigation, because it's not sure. Uh, I was really surprised with this ratio, because I was expecting to see larger uh, portion of the C trees shared between the samples. Uh, maybe uh, the normalization is not well uh, configured, and we need to filter out more results. So. And this is their, regarding the unique trees. And however, if we take a look at their, uh, their, uh, this approach, uh, but from the point of view of the samples with repeated and non-repeated trees, we can see that 9% uh, of the samples contain, uh, uh, sorry, 9% of the samples, they are sharing uh, between each other C trees, while 91% are not sharing. When it comes to a C trees reaching entry point and their uh, average and standard deviation of their depth, we can see that r roughly 50 C trees that we dumped were able to reach the entry point, and the average depth is five. So that means that most of the C trees we dumped is are five calls away from the entry point. So this result are, might be interesting for, uh, let's say, your those who are developing emulators, because sometimes when you're when you're emulating the code, you need to know where exactly you need to stop during the emulation, and you're, uh, like having an average depth of five, or that means that you're you need to emulate up to five call depth to be able to reach those routines which we were dumping. And there, uh, here is their uh, uh, C trees with their. Uh, cross-references to them. We put here maximum 10, the top 10, uh, the top 10 uh, C trees. And they're, like we have one C tree with 11,000 cross-references to it, so this is a pretty high, and this is an outstanding number. As we can see in this table, the, this uh, number of parents is uh, steadily decreasing. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, you can go to the original version of the presentation to get complete results. Uh, in this, uh, in the last part of the presentation, I'm going to speaking about the validating the methodology we were using because we are, uh, run uh, this uh, algorithms on a large set of malware, and then we wanted to apply the same algorithms to a smaller set, which we know is related, to be able to validate and see how well it works uh, in this case. So here is the uh, timeline of the modern C++ or, uh, malware used in targeted attacks. There are different groups identified, uh, Stuxnet, Ducor, Equation, and Animal Farm. So for this case, we choose your Animal Farm case study because uh, we know that there, uh, this, uh, uh, this malware is written in C++ and they're, they're all related. And there is a very nice presentation uh, on, this, uh, on this topic presented at Aricon last year, Totally Spies, where you can get all the complete information on their analysis of this or malware family. But a briefer uh, introduction to it, it was discovered by Canadian agency CSEC as an operations law globe, and it was written in our Microsoft Visual C++. So that, that's, that's actually what we wanted. So we applied our algorithms to our, this uh, malwares, and we tried to compare and find some similarities. For instance, here you can see the comparison of Casper's and Dino's virtual tables found in, their, uh, in the output of our tools, and we can see that there is some intersection. 
there are two objects here. Um, the run key and auto del, which are shared between those two samples. So that means our virtual table approach or uh, identification works here. And there, uh, there is a definition of the run key. So the run key defines how malware uh, communicates with the registry. This is a base class, and there are some subclasses which define particular implementations, like the malware can uh, access register directly by API using common prompt, using Windows management instrumentation classes, and uh, uh, from uh, rec command. And Autodel defines how malware actually removes itself from their system after infection. And there are also different subclasses related to API using uh, uh, move file to remove itself or using uh, common prompt or using Windows management instrument instrumentation classes. And the usage of this, each particular uh, subclass depends on their parameters, of the, on the configuration parameters of the malware. So we did identify the similarities, and we tried to reconstruct their object attributes. So here is their, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the Casper's run key constructor, and on the right-hand side, you can see Dino's run key constructor, and there is a significant difference here. Because in, ca in case of the Casper, each object is created depending on their configuration value. Uh, uh, so for instance, if there is a, a AV strategy run key API, is set, it creates only an uh, object with run key API. Otherwise, if there is AV strategy run key registry, it creates only an object with run key registry. While in Dino's case, it creates one large object which contains other objects as sub-objects. And if you try to reconstruct the virtual tables, we will see that they are not equal, and in this case, our, pro our approach doesn't work. Okay, let's go um, further, and we compared also Dino's virtual function tables with NBOTs. Again, we can see that there is an overlap uh, in virtual tables. So here again, our virtual table uh, algorithm works well. We are able to identify the intersection of the same virtual tables, so that means they share uh, similar code. And uh, if we go to the constructors, they are pretty much similar. Uh, like not 100%, but they are very similar. And they would try to uh, identify or reconstruct the uh, attributes of the structure. Uh, we will get the same, exactly the same structure. So here it works well, and it's very nice. So here is the table which uh, summarizes the shared uh, types or between different malware families. We can see that most of them share a lot of code between each other. And it's also interesting to see that or there is a, a, some small difference between Casper and Dino. Uh, the Casper contains implementations of uh, run key VMI and Autodel VMI. And uh, Casper appeared after Dino. That means it was an evolution of the Dino. So they reused code uh, in Dino by adding uh, additional functionality. And here is uh, the same uh, information, but from the different point of view, uh, the number of their shared types are in this malware families. Yeah, we can see that the Arduino and uh, Casper are highly correlated, so they share a lot of uh, reused code. So uh, to conclude the presentation, uh, so uh, uh, what we did, we actually uh, uh, distributed IDA Pro, so we demonstrated that our IDA Pro can be distributed, uh, can be run in large scale in batch mode, and there, uh, but however, there are some uh, uh, actions that we need to apply to make them run, and there, there is a call for plugin developers. It would be a nice option if you also add a special batch mode for your plugins, not only for interactive work with the user. And of course, if you want to uh, test your plugin uh, on millions of samples, you can send it to us and your, we'll see uh, how it works. And we also will be releasing a special version of your Code Explorer for North State Conference. Uh, we're going to release it to your... Uh, hmm? 
control Z, yeah, so actually, yeah, a few things like uh, we were actually going to release it before, but we need to do some code cleanup. So as Olivia told, it can take quite long, but we hope we're, it will be done soon. And again, uh, it's 21st century, and there is no control Z in hex -rays code explorer. So this is actually where we are going to address in North Stack edition of the, uh, of the plugin. So this will be one of the uh, biggest improvements, and we also will add a major feature extracting type information in C trees in JSON format because right now it's dumped into your custom text file, which is not really good. So we'll fix this one. And here are some thoughts for future work, uh, which we're going to do, uh, like or what we would like to concentrate on. Uh, maybe you have different uh, feature requests, so please let us know. Like uh, one of them is pardon matching for C trees. Let's say you can find in the IDB functions or by C tree pattern. You see, you say you input this uh, C tree pattern and it outputs all the functions which meet this pattern. This might be useful for the vulnerability research, uh, crypto identification, integration with OpenRail. So not only use the IDA and Hex Race Code Explorer as a base tool, but also use the uh, uh, OpenRail project released by Crush. And uh, if you have any bugs and uh, uh, features, so please submit them. Uh, if you're interested in the project, you can discuss uh, Code Explorer on our Hins Gitter channel. So we're really looking for the feedback. And before I conclude the presentation, I would like to uh, uh, say some acknowledgments to our employers and uh, uh, to our Ilfa Gulfanov and Hexrex team for their support of this research. Without them, this research wouldn't have been done. So thank you, and uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions.